Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. Welcome, everybody, to the latest episode of Long Box Carpentry, where we're talking about all of the various tie-in comics to the films of John Carpenter. Joining me, as always, is J.D. DeMott. Call me Snake. No. Oh. I'll call you Asshole. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> we'll get to that one. <laughs> we'll get to that one, yeah. Ugh. And I am, of course, Noel. So, yeah, this time we are covering the Snake Pliskin comic books. Not the current ones, because there is currently an Escape from New York series running, but most people don't know there were two earlier Snake Plissken comics, The Adventures of Snake Plissken, Plissken with two S's, and The Snake Plissken Chronicles. Before we get to them, JD. Yes. Have you seen both Snake Plissken movies? And if so, what do you think of them? I have seen both of them. I really don't love Escape from New York that much. There are some great moments there, and I love Kurt Russell as Snake, but I think the action itself, it probably needed like a slightly bigger budget to really accomplish what it was trying to do. But it had James Cameron special effects. Yeah, but James Cameron can only do so much with 350 and some plywood. You haven't seen Xenogenesis. Yeah, true. <laughs> I mean, it's a classic for a reason. And there's a lot of iconic moments and things in it. I just, I remember watching that film and then walking away from it and I can't remember what happened in it. Mm. A lot of it just kind of blurred together. But I also have a really soft spot in my heart for Escape from L.A., even though it's a terrible movie in a lot of yeah. respects. But there's so many things I love about it. It's a movie with Mr. Pink and Uncle Ben and Bruce Campbell and all these other like really great character actors doing their thing. And it's so cheesy. And the special effects are just awful, especially <laughs> say what you will about doing something with Flywood and 350 and change. The surfing. The, uh, the submarine. The CGI. <laughs> <laughs> I is, you know, I think yeah. that, that was just terrible. But I watched through it again just recently, and I kind of enjoyed it still, despite how silly it is. It's a guilty pleasure, definitely, but it's not one I can really throw away just because there's so much fun to be had in it, which is something that I think Escape from New York took itself mostly seriously. And I think that L.A., you know... Not at all. <laughs> yeah, it, it knew it was a joke. It was going in to have fun. And it doesn't help that it basically is a repeat of the same plot as the first film, but I don't know. I like it. Both of them have their place, but... But given a choice between something that was technically better but is kind of dated or something that's super bad but fun in a cheesy way, I'll take the super cheesy one. I genuinely enjoy Escape from New York because I think it also builds very nicely, I think, on the whole vibe that Assault on Precinct 13 had, though I don't think it's as good of a movie as that. But I do think that it is a kind of looser, leaner film than it seems to be on the surface. And it's one of those films that kind of the more you think about it, and the more you poke at it, the more it kind of falls apart. Mm -hmm. But I still really like New York. I kind of like Snake Plissken when it's a little more of an edge to it than silliness. Yeah. And I will say, even though I love the silliness of L.A., I think Snake works best when you take him absolutely seriously. I like when John Carpenter gets to actually bring Western elements into something because he's such a Western fan. Mm -hmm. And I think Snake Plissken is the closest he came to directing an out-and-out -out Western. Yeah, I can see that. I mean, he's basically doing Clint Eastwood. What's interesting about these is I didn't know about the first of these comics that we're going to be talking about, which is a Marvel Presents Paramount comics, The Adventures of Snake Plissken which was released January 1997, I want to say five months after Escape from L.A. came out. You'd think they would try to coincide a little more. Well, it says January 1997, so yeah. If you read through the back matter, it does say that it was delayed yeah. a few months. Well, and I see that on the credits page, they credit the coloring to Malibu Comics, in parentheses, R.I.P. Yeah. I looked up the dates. It was in 94 that Marvel bought Malibu and started using their coloring system. It was in 1996, mid-1996, that they fully shut it down and shuttered all of, like, the Ultraverse characters and everything. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if this was delayed because it was meant to be part of the Malibu imprint. Or because Escape from L.A. did not do as well as it was supposed to. Yeah. Because, uh, what, made, like, half its budget back or something? Yeah. 
it wasn't a huge bomb, but it wasn't very well received. Yeah, yeah. And I could see that being a problem when you're trying to like sell like, oh, we're going to put out a comic book for this movie that was not loved. Well, and then I should also mention Len Kaminsky, who wrote this. He was doing a lot of the Malibu titles after they made the move to Marvel. So I think it makes sense that this was probably under that umbrella and that it was probably in mid-production when that umbrella was closed. Mm, that makes sense. The comic was written by Len Kaminsky, penciled by Rod Whittingham, and inked by Stephen Baskerville. You familiar with any of them? I know Lynn Kaminsky a little bit. I've had to look him up. He's not somebody that really leaps to the forefront of my memory, but I've actually read through some of his stuff. He did three issues of Avengers. I know I've read. He's probably best known for having... He didn't create the character of James Rhodes, but he did, I believe, introduce Rhodey as War Machine. Mm. He actually had a pretty sizable run on Iron Man during that time. He was one of those guys who, like, looking through his biography, he's one of those just the guys who, like, wrote anything Marvel needed, usually not for very long runs, except for he did Ghost Rider 2099, he did all 25 issues of that, and he did a pretty sizable run on Iron Man, and everything else was just kind of, like, fill-in stories or whatnot, for the most part. I remember I liked the first issue of Ghost Rider 2099. I'd never read anything more of that. It was kind of a cool cyberpunk take on the character. It's one of those ones that I want to check out. Yeah. By the way, did you see what the very first thing he wrote for Marvel was? No. You and I, before this episode, were discussing Transformers. He did a fill-in issue of Transformers called Plight of the Bumblebee. Oh, very cool. Yeah, and it looks like then he did a run on Web of Spider-Man and then Iron Man and Avengers and all that stuff. And apparently had like a, a big long run on Bloodshot when it was over at Valiant and still does stuff today. Mm -hmm. I had known him from Rune from his Ultraverse work. Mm. He didn't do the original stuff. That was Barry Windsor Smith, but he was the one again who took it over when it came to Marvel. And then Rod Whittingham, I'm not too familiar with. Looked like he did a lot of, like, franchise comics. Hellraiser, G.I. Joe. A lot of G.I. Joe, I noticed. Not super familiar with him. It was kind of interesting because this is a Marvel comic, and I'm, the name I knew best on that was the editor, Bob Harris, and he was the editor-in-chief at that time. And other than Malibu, a lot of the names did not leap to mine. And then Stephen Baskerville, he's been doing a lot of inks. He actually got his start as part of the Transformers UK crew back in the 80s. Hmm. But yeah, no, it's an interesting crew. And then I, I should also point out, I looked him up, the editor, Mark Panicia, he is currently the editor-in-chief of the entire X-Men line at Marvel. Okay. His name sounded familiar, but I, the editors, I really don't follow that closely except for a handful, either because they're the editor-in-chief and therefore in charge of the direction of the universe as a whole, or because I have happened to have met a couple editors at cons who are, I happen to enjoy, so I kind of follow their work. But yeah, he's gone from editing the Adventures of Snake Plissken <laughs> to now being the supervising editor of the entire X-Men line. That's a bit of an upgrade. Bit of an upgrade, yeah. And as far as I know, that'll be a bit different on the next comic we're covering. As far as I know, there was no involvement in this from like Carpenter or Deborah Hill or anything. It feels like something that was just designed to be... It's a tie-in. It's a tie-in. But I gotta say, they could be worse. Yeah. Well, let's just say, so what's this one about? I would say it's Snake Plissken versus Robocop. <laughs> yeah, it's... Kind of. It's weird. It's a, basically, it's a one-shot issue where Snake is trying to make a score off... Uh, off of some engineered multiviruses that he stole. Yeah. And of course, the big deal is going down in a smoke easy which is an illegal house of tobacco. This is one thing I really enjoy about this comic is there's a lot of little touches like that that kind of build up the world because we've only been into basically prison areas. And I want to say this is Chicago? Yes. You kind of get to see what the normal world looks like, at least in the, you know... Under the police state. Right, under the police state. And so it's kind of interesting. Yeah, and then, so of course, then the fence rats him out to the police, but Snake gets away. And I love the scene where he buys the fence a drink by pouring the the multivirus down his throat. Yeah. He holds a gun to his head and said, we're going to do shots. Turning the guy into a thing from another world. Yeah. There's actually a few <laughs> uh, Carpenter shout outs here. There's also a panel that says, they live, we sleep. Ooh. As graffiti in the background. What ends up happening next is that they send a robot after Snake that's been programmed to think like him. It's an ATAC, a bipedal cybernetic machine that is designed to think like a criminal so that it can catch a criminal. To be honest, I really thought it was kind of lame at first. It was. Then comes the twist, though. 
where Snake drives a pole through its eye, causing its system to reboot. So now he actually thinks he is Snake Plissken. Right. And starts looking around the city and saying, I understand now why you do what you do. And then Snake guns him down in cold blood, saying, I don't need competition. Yeah. I really <laughs> like this story. I think it is yeah. an utterly pointless tie-in, <laughs> fill-in type thing. It has no impact on the character. The closest thing we get is the last panel where they somebody says, I hear Cleveland's nice this time of year. Yeah. But as a story where Snake has to like have like a mini adventure that really has no impact on the character himself or anything, it's kind of fun. For a 20-page quickie. Yeah, for Lynn Kaminsky, I think really has studied the films, both of them, pretty closely. We get to see some of the city-state, the police state of Chicago, which is kind of interesting. But a lot of the little touches, like you mentioned, like there's a smoke easy where you can't have tobacco. So you have to go to an illegal den. And like the robot confronting these homeless people, you know, yeah. saying that they violating moral codes. And then watching the police gun those homeless people down causes a change of heart in the robot. Right. As he suddenly feels sadness at what the world has become. Yeah, it's fluff. But it's enjoyable fluff. It's something that if you were super into these films, I could see like it scratching the itch at least. It may not completely satisfy you, but after having read through all those, and I know you like some of those The Thing comics, but- <laughs> No, I'm not going to defend them to that degree. <laughs> yeah, but and admittedly, I think it's a little easier when you have an action story versus a horror story. And it's also a world. Yeah. It's an entire world to complete with. Right. Admittedly, it's not like you go to Snake Plissken for a complex character who has all these nuances. He's a bit of a bastard, but not unrecognizably so, and we'll get to that later. But I enjoyed this one. I really, like, I was surprised, like, after having read those four Thing miniseries, well, five, if you can count the one shot. No. I was going to say, for the most part, they didn't really feel like the movie, or if they did, they just felt like they were repeating the movie. This feels like something slightly, like a twist on this formula. You know, you have a giant robot, you had Snake essentially confronting himself. I think if this was a longer thing, it would probably be into something where Snake has to, like, realize that he doesn't like himself and kind of go into more detail. But I kind of like that it's just a, nah, he just shoots him down, like, pretty quickly as soon as he realizes what's going on. You know, it's fun. I also recommend this. It's not great. And again, the setup very much feels like, oh, we're going to do Snake Plissken versus Robocop. But it goes in an interesting direction with it. I like that it presents an actual moral struggle. I like that it gets into Snake's head both why he's a hero and why he's a villain. Because mm -hmm. Snake is not a good guy. No. He is not a good guy. But he's better than the other bad guys. I think that's what sets him apart, like a classic Western gunslinger is. He's not the hero. He's just not the villain who's going to screw you over the worst. Right. Snake is always about survival. And I think he realized that having this robot, you know. Well, but it's not always just about survival because he is always actively trying to oppose the government, too. True. He's not always just doing things because it's him. But I think part of that is because the government is in his way of what life he wants to live. Mm -hmm. But he also has somewhat of a soft side to him, but he doesn't allow it to show very often. He kind of hates that he has a soft side. Yeah, exactly. Again, yeah, I think it opens great. I think it ends great. I think just that bit in the middle there, I mean, it gets such a short story. It's only 20 pages. Mm -hmm. But all the stuff with the fence and like him catching up on the fence and pouring the virus, I was like the whole side plot of the virus was ultimately meaningless because the virus just went into the fence. Yeah. But I mean, that's a good MacGuffin. Right. It's one of those things that was, if this had been like a mini series, I think we would probably would have gotten like two issues just devoted yeah. to him, like getting the virus and then going to find the guy and all that. Instead, because it's so breezy of a read, they get to the point and then they move on. And that's probably for the best. The only part of the comic that it's not that it was bad, but I just didn't quite understand why it was there was the woman who loans him the knife because he never actually uses the knife. He does. He stabs the robot in the shoulder. But that's not what causes the robot yeah. to change. No, it's just something that slows him down. I, it's not really. I think it's just that way they can give the knife back and to tease Cleveland, you know, which is fine. I was kind of worried that we were going to get the Cleveland story, which, to be honest, I think works best as just something that is mentioned often. It's always mentioned, but we never see. Like him stealing the the multivirus it's entirely off screen he's already done it mm -hmm. they're already hunting him for it well i'm wondering if elements like that like the introduction of her or like the introduction of fry and the other government people i wonder if this was also kind of meant to be like a pilot 
Like, we could do additional stories after this? It feels like it. I mean, and to be honest, reading through it, it's like I said, it feels clear that Kaminsky has done his homework. Mm -hmm. It doesn't feel like something like, oh, this is a paid gig. I'm just going to rush through. And yeah, I've seen the movie once. He's actually mapping out the world a bit. Yeah, as much as you can in 22 pages. Just in terms of the uniforms and the lingo they use, it's interesting, the the military police force. Mm Mm-hmm. And it's interesting because they never encounter Snake. Right. I imagine that, again, if this had been longer, I have a feeling like Snake would have gone after them. But because they really just don't have time, you know, it's them going, oh, hey, our robots kind of turned against us. What should we do? And I have a feeling that they might have come back later on. You know, maybe not with another robot, but some of these characters might have been in the back of Kaminsky's head. It's like, I could bring some of these guys back in a future story if I get the chance. Yeah, it would have been interesting to see. And then I'm guessing that the next story would be what happened in Cleveland. And then I'm wondering if this was meant to be issue one of a four-issue miniseries. And because of whatever happened with Malibu, the rest of that didn't happen. And that it was meant to be a prequel that would lead into the movie. Yeah. It feels like there's stuff missing here that we never got. It's definitely a better first issue than Northman Nightmare. Yeah. It's really hard to judge a one-issue comic. Like judging a pilot, yeah. Yeah, you can see potential in it, but it's really hard to see if there were any follow-through that would be worthwhile. But, like I said, I liked it, so I would have bought issue two if it had come out. And what did you think of the art by uh, Whittingham and Baskerville? It's pretty typical art of the 90s. Well, it's not like super Rob Liefeldian. But... No, 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 no. It's... Muscly. It is very much... I mean, this the head looks more or less like Kurt Russell. I mean, it's kind of an easy drawing it's just stubble long hair and eye patch but the muscles and stuff it looks very like a he's beefy he's a very beefy guy far beefier than kurt russell's ever been but i like that it's a little more understated just in terms of like his layouts and everything it feels more grounded and the detailing is very nice Mm -hmm. it actually reminds me a lot of some of the later stuff that michael golden did Not as good. It's a little clunky around the edges, Mm -hmm. but there's some really good stuff in there. Again, shots like when the robot sees the homeless people getting shot and genuinely affecting. We talked about Climate of Fear, and I kind of call that as a very 90s style comic. And this is also, but in a way better executed fashion. The storytelling's good. The panel layouts are well done. The figures and the detailing. I mean, like even the woman doesn't look like a 90s woman. (laughs) No. They don't show a lot of cleavage or anything like that, at least unnecessarily so. Well, here's the thing I would say is that even though he's muscly, it's still realistic anatomy. Right. He looks like Stallone or or Schwarzenegger. You know, he doesn't look like... Kurt's a little smaller. Yeah. He also doesn't look like a Liefeld 16-pack muscles or impossible anatomy type stuff. You know, he looks big. And to be fair, the camo pants were already there. Yeah, yeah. I like the art. My only issue with the writing is there's a few too many bits where it does these weird human sound effects. Hmm. Like you have the one fence constantly coughing and clearing his throat in the smoke easy, which I get the point of it. Yeah. But then it's like, even as we move to the military, the scientist is always making weird noises in response to the general. And I think the first line from the general is, Hernk. <laughs> Well, that seemed to be like a thing that they did. Like, I remember Grant Morrison did a lot of herms for Batman. Or no, it was hit. <laughs> but yeah, it's one of those things that I think has kind of gone away from comics. Like, they don't try to overdo the accents as much. And like, this one wasn't bad with that, but I've seen that in other comics around this time. We have one page where Snake has three lines. Hink, <laughs> ng, and gnick, <clears throat> and gnarg. <laughs> Yeah, and the the robot makes a lot of like even the robot <laughs> Zack Skack Skizzerp. There's one where the robot actually goes Nk, too, like he's clearing his throat. Skrizop <laughs> is one, which sounds like a white person trying to write urban lingo or something, but um, or a robot trying to break into hip hop. There you go. I am Skrizop. I shall lay down the beat. <laughs> uh, I am the non-human beatbox. <laughs> I was kind of surprised by this one. And again, as I started it, I'm like, this is interesting. And then the robot appeared and I kind of like lost all hope. But then they brought me back around with the way that they actually went with the robot. Yeah. If it had just been like, oh, I can predict what you're going to do, that would have been super lame. And and we had a bit of that where it's the robot is like, oh, you're using this model of gun, which has this caliber of bullet, you know, and I shall modify my strategy to get around it. Yeah. And I'm like, okay. I would have been like, uh, why can't you just say you have a really cool robot instead of saying it's based on Pliskin? And its name is Attacks. Yeah. 
autonomous tracking and combat system. There's definitely some really cheesy bits, but for yeah. what it is, it's enjoyable enough. I think if you're a diehard escape fan, I think you could probably do worse than checking this one out. All right, so do you want to move on to the next series? Let's move on. Or do we have to? <laughs> oh, that doesn't sound promising. Uh, well, we'll get into it. Okay, so then this is an interesting time. Because I remember this was when I was at Comic-Con in 2002. They had a big panel on it. John Carpenter, Deborah Hill, and Kurt Russell jointly regained control of the Snake Plissken character and owned the rights. Mm -hmm. And they were trying to relaunch the franchise. Not only were they toying around with the idea of getting a new movie made, because the third attempt, Escape from Mars, ended up becoming... Coming Ghosts of Mars. We'll get into that one on that episode. <laughs> but there was this whole big push to try to get Snake back off the ground. Like Namco was doing a Tomb Raider style engine video game, which you can actually see demo footage of on YouTube. Yeah. I think I'm a bit more of a gamer than you are. And I have to say, I really thought it was kind of cool. It reminded me a bit of Max Payne, which had a lot of the bullet time elements that you can see in the trailer for that game. I am somewhat familiar because I, I spent a week staying at a buddy's house back in the early 2000s. And he had the Siphon Filter games, mm. which had that very similar game engine, kind of like a Metal Gear, the kind of over the shoulder first person shooter yeah. style engine. I think I would have probably played that game. And it looked pretty well finished. It looked better than the Thing game. Yeah. <laughs> it looked relatively polished. I imagine they probably had a lot of like polishing to do. And admittedly, it's probably easy to fake footage if you have to, but it looked good. I think they completed two playable levels and had actually allowed people to play demos of those for reviews and stuff. But at some point, it just shut down. They were going to do a Snake Plissken anime series. Which would have been interesting. I admit I'm not as big of a fan of anime, but it looks interesting. I would need to see more to kind of get a feel for how it would have turned out. What did you think of the designs? I like the designs. Mm -hmm. Some of the women are a little overly sexualized, but I think it's a really nice art style. I think there's a lot of great distinction to the characters. It kind of fits the world. Like if you did a slightly exaggerated Batman the Animated Series style, slightly over the top version of the series, I could see this playing out. Mm -hmm. So let's see. They worked on the Ghost in the Shell, primarily the TV series. Oh, they did Pat Labor. Pat Labor is a good show. Projection ID is just looking at their credits, XXOlic, Tsubasa Chronicles. They do good stuff. They do really good high quality works. Oh, Fooly Cooly. That's right. They worked on Fooly Cooly. Ooh. Then they also did the famous Kill Bill anime sequence. Oh, that's cool. I can see that because that style seems to match with what we see in these drawings. I think a little bit yeah. closer than some of the other ones. I'm intrigued by the boy whose name is Ein Space Stein. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, some of these like sugar and spice and baked. Like, I love Colonel Law. Colonel Law looks so perfect to be in opposition to Snake. Yeah. It would be interesting to see them flesh some of this out a bit more. And I know there's actually, because I sent you, it was the Ain't It Cool News article. I know they actually put up a second article that had even more, mm. but I can't find it off the top of my searches. Yeah. I think it would have been cool. I think it could have had a kind of fun Cowboy Bebop vibe if you did it right. Oh, yeah. I could see it working, especially with having the trio of Carpenter, Hill, and Russell involved. I don't know if they would have gotten Russell to voice Snake. I can't imagine that would be hard work for him because Snake doesn't tend to talk a whole lot. You can get the Cowboy Bebop guy. Yeah. He'd be fine. Uh, Steve Bloom. Yeah, actually, that would be really good. I think it could have been fun. I just, based on the sketches, there's just not a whole lot of information. Right. But I would totally watch a Snake Plissken anime. Check the little text feature on Skype. I found the second page. Oh, well, nice to see Sky Malone tied up and collared, but um, yeah, first image. That's where things get a little sexualized. Yeah. I like the president, how he's got this kind of laid back, friendly charm, and then you see him screaming in rage. I could see that being the character of the president in this series. Yeah. And that, well, it kind of seems to fit with how they've shown the president to be, in, especially in L.A., where he just acts like he's a nice guy until the point where he decides that doesn't benefit him anymore. I wonder if the character of Judas would have betrayed him at some point. I don't know. I think he looks like a trustworthy guy. <laughs> and then, yeah, then they also have some storyboards for the opening segment. It would have been interesting just to see how this would have played out. Yeah. 
I don't know what with Carpenter having kind of mostly retired and Hill passed on. I don't know if we're ever going to see anything more like this. I think Russell would be up for it, but I don't know if he would want to do it without John. Well, you know, they've already been working on a remake for years. Yeah. They spend so long working on it at one studio that it fell apart and now it's being worked on at another studio. No. So I think if a new movie comes out, I could see them doing some more tie-ins and prep for it. And then if it's successful, maybe getting something more. It would be cool if someone would dust this stuff off, but I don't even know if the rights are in a way that they can. It's kind of like the Terminator TV series. They can never, ever go back to anything that they created for that TV series ever again. Yeah. You can make more Terminator stuff, but you cannot touch anything for that TV series ever again because of the way the rights work. Mm. So I don't know if any of this stuff is available. But anyways, this is a rather long lead-in yes. <laughs> to the comic book series, which came out from cross-gen comics. Kind of. And this was a period where cross-gen was nearing the end of their run. Because cross-gen just got to a point where they just stopped paying people and then shut their doors. Despite the fact that they were like hugely successful there for a few years. Yeah, it was always something I really admired because they were trying to do Marvel better than Marvel. Like they wanted to have a genuine bullpen and they had rights programs for the writers and artists and they wanted to do all these things that Marvel kind of did. They were even doing stuff that we're seeing come back now. They were one of the first comics companies where you could buy digital copies through their store. Yeah. They weren't the best quality, but they it was like a PDF file, which is still what a lot of DRM free files are now today. And they were one of the first to focus almost primarily on trades, where the issues were almost secondary to mm -hmm. the trades, because they wanted to sell in bookstores as opposed to comic shops. Right. And they also had it kind of tied in universe, but at the same time, it was never... It never crossed over. Well, really. the, yeah, they were tied in, but not crossed over. What's fascinating about it is they did a shared comic book universe where none of the titles are superhero books. Yeah. You have high fantasy, you have urban fantasy, you have the deities, you have soft sci-fi, hard sci-fi, you have horror comics, you have a martial arts comic. They tried to cover as many variants as they could that wasn't a superhero comic. They did a couple of superhero comics later, but those were not part of that universe. Yeah. Because it was right around 2003, after they had been running since 1998, so like four or five years in, that they started kind of doing Red Star, the Code 6 books, Demon Wars, Snake Plissken, where stuff that was set outside that universe. Because mm -hmm. their main titles ran for like 40 issues before they folded. Well, I noticed that after issue two, you don't see the cross-gen logo on the comics anymore for the Chronicles of Snake Plissken. Might just be these files. It could be, but I wonder if, like you said, it was towards the end of CrossGen. I wonder if it might have been... Oh, I see. Hurricane Entertainment. Yeah. It could just be that the production work was being done by CrossGen. It was being distributed by Hurricane. Right. Because I'm looking. Yeah, they're not even in the copyright page. Mm-hmm. This Hurricane. Okay, that's interesting. I didn't notice that. I haven't read a whole lot of CrossGen, so I was actually kind of really curious to see. Like, I mean, I didn't expect this, obviously, to tie in into their non-universe universe, but this is one of the few CrossGen books I've actually ever read. And so I was noticing that when all of a sudden the logo went away. I should note, the creative team on this one did not really work on any other cross-gen books. Mm -hmm. Bill O'Neill and Tone Rodriguez had worked together on a couple of indie comics, which caught a lot of attention, particularly one called Violent Messiahs. What I noticed was that apparently Bill O'Neill had drawn the first issue of Violent Messiahs, and then Tone Rodriguez did the subsequent yeah. issues, and then neither one of them were writers. He's become a writer since, but he did start out as a penciler. So did Alan Moore. I will say a lot of comic <laughs> artists have done that. William O'Neill, yeah, he had done some art for like Gen 13 and Authority and some of the early Wildstorm stuff. And then he was the primary co-writer on Fathom, the Michael Turner series. Oh. When that first debuted. I remember it. I haven't actually read any of it, but I remember that was like his big book up until his tragic death. And I think that was when he made the big transition to writing. And then that's when he did Chassis, where she started working with Tone. And then they forged this relationship that then led to Snake Plissken. I honestly haven't read any of their other work, except I did read some of those early Fathom issues, but I'm not that familiar with Tone. I'd like to read some more of Tone. So the main plot of this one, it's more like circling around a whole bunch of characters that are opposing each other, and we'll kind of roll through some of those characters as we discuss them. But it all circles around trying to steal the car that JFK was assassinated in. So a collector can add it to his collection. Mm-hmm. And Snake gets caught up in this. He gets betrayed. He gets betrayed by other people. He gets betrayed by other people. He ends up befriending Captain Ron. Yeah. 
Which I was wondering if that was an intentional shout out, right? Yep. Okay. Because Kurt Russell loves that movie still. Yeah. So do I. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. Before we move into the discussion, just do you recommend this one? Not really, no. It feels, it's not terrible. I think it got better as it went along, but it's not very good, especially in the writing more than anything. I think mostly the dialogue. I won't say the dialogue in the movies were hard hitting rat-a-tat patter, but some of these lines are just terrible. (laughs) Asshole. Yeah, but it's not the worst thing I've ever read. I think I liked it better than some of the thing tie-ins that we did, but it's mediocre. What do you think? I loved it. Really? Yeah, I thought the plot was a bit weaker. I actually like the dialogue because that's how I write dialogue. Oh. Remember that thing comic where I'm like, I like the art because that's how I draw. <laughs> <laughs> I like this dialogue because God, do I do cheap, smart assy dialogue myself. <laughs> Some of the one liner. I mean, for one thing, Snake is best when he's mostly silent. And some of these like one liners. Some of the one liners were a bit too 90s action movie. I agree with that. You from Jersey? Which exit wound? Oh, I liked the exit wound. Garden State? Garden Variety Asshole. I liked the exit wound. It might have been (laughs) clever if they didn't follow it up with the Garden State Garden Variety Asshole, like, immediately after that. It's just, okay, we get it, Jersey, haha. It's just, I've never really seen Snake as a big one-liner guy. My big one is when he kills the big bad at the end, and it's like, Mars, you're a real trip. And then he trips him. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I absolutely give you that one. I just was groaning. Like, I didn't mind so much the other characters, but just Snake doing that sort of thing, I just felt, like, wrong. Yeah. And immediately, like I said, I do think as they went along, they got a better pacing for it. He still does it, but it's not nearly as often as, like, the first few pages of this. I just was like, oh, do I have to really finish all this? <laughs> to be fair, that's what he was like in L.A. Yeah. It's not what he was like in New York, but that is what he was like in L.A. Like I said, <laughs> I like it when Snake is treated seriously and everything else around him is gonzo insane. To a degree. Like, I think there is some gonzo stuff here that I, some of it, which I think works and some of it doesn't. Before you get into examples, I actually do want to kind of just roll through each character as we go along, because it's a very character driven one. I did just want to just finish up my thoughts by saying, I really also like the odd characters that it sets up. This reminded me almost more like an Elmore Leonard type thing, kind of like get shorty, Jackie Brown type thing, where it's just, here's a bunch of characters who all want one thing and they keep running into each other. I can kind of see that. And I also love that it's a plot to steal JFK's car, which led to some really tasteless sight gags, but they were surprisingly funny tasteless sight gags. And there was one that I was expecting as soon as you see it, but when it actually happened, I was like, yeah, okay, that was kind of funny. Yeah, and then it all leads to a blimp. <laughs> I love the art. The art really worked for me. I think it's better than the last one. It's so expressive, too. Yeah. I think some of the inking was a little rough. This wasn't inked. No, it wasn't? This was that period where they started to get to the point where it's, let's just digitally process pencils. Well, and I think you can kind of see that because some of it looks... It's a little sketchier. Yeah, it's a little sketchier. But I think I'm used to that because that was always a process that I liked when it started a decade ago. Yeah. Like I said, I don't mind it. I think it would have been better if it had been traditionally inked, but I think it's very expressive, and I think it looks a lot more like Kurt as far as Snake goes. He definitely has the scowl. Yeah, and he doesn't look as beefy. Right. He looks more like a Kurt-sized Kurt. Right. Which is, you know, I mean, don't get me wrong, Kurt Russell could probably still kick my ass even today, but, you know, he just doesn't look like a bodybuilder. Oh, yeah. He's never looked like Stallone, but I mean, he still looks like he could, I mean, like, just look at him in Stargate, you know, he looks like he could still break you in half. Right. But he he's always kind of got that more compact build. I thought you'd be taller. <laughs> Boy, everyone sure thought he was dead in this one. Yeah. I even love that that's a plot point where someone says it was Snake Plissken. You idiot, it can't be Snake Plissken. I know you're lying to me. He's dead. Yeah. Like I said, (laughs) I think because this is a guy who hasn't had a whole lot of writing experience by this point, I think he got better as he went along. See, and what I love is a lot of the scenes, there's a lot of people sitting down and talking in this comic. Yeah. There's not a whole lot of action. When the action comes, it's striking, but... There's a lot of conversation scenes. And I really like some of the little gag bits, like the elderly people at the bus stop. (laughs) The elderly gun appreciation society or something like that? Yeah, the ones who basically decided that us whippersnappers are disrespectful to the morals that America has. See, I love that entire scene where they run out of gas in the JFK mobile. And they have to hold up a bus driver, and the passengers on the bus all turn out to be armed senior citizens who are part of an armed senior citizen. 
great. Yeah. And then Snake just blows up the damn bus. But you were going to talk about the characters. Well, why don't we just start off with Bruce Campbell as Mars? <laughs> I hadn't put that together, but I can kind of see that. Oh, they are straight up drawing Bruce Campbell. <laughs> well, he's got the goatee and the white streak in his hair, so that, I can see it now that you say that. I remember <laughs> even when I read this comic back in 2003. <laughs> Because I did read this comic when it first came out. Actually, I think I only read the first issue because that was all I bought before they became hard to find. I'm wondering if the changeover uh, to Hurricane made them hard to find. They talk in the pages that they were like, oh, we're going to give this away with the DVD set and all this. And my guess is it may not have sold as well. Because they also talked about like, oh, we're going to do like four issue series. And then we're going to like do some one shots. And then we'll do like another four issue mini. And they were kind of going to go with the Hellboy method. Yeah, which clearly never happened. Well, I mean, like Mars, I like that he's kind of like the polar opposite of Snake and that he's a flashy, fast talker, constantly running his mouth. But he's also constantly changing sides. Is he your ally? Is he your enemy? Is he your ally? He's very much like that character from Crystal Skull, where you just don't know, are you supposed to trust him or not? Or like Steve Buscemi in Escape from L.A. Yeah, in Escape from L.A. But he also is very much holds his own and commands. And I kind of like that the final fight becomes him and Snake. Yeah. He's not even really the big bad, but he is the primary antagonist. The problem is I have is that they were, we're being told like, oh, Snake doesn't have friends, but if he's got people he tolerates and those he wants to slowly drive a knife into. I don't know, like, that I believe, but it just feels like, I don't know why this guy would be one of the ones that Snake tolerates. Probably because he knows where all the business deals are. Yeah. I mean, because let's be honest, the reason they're stealing this car is so they can sell it off and Snake can get a ton of money that he can go hide with for a while. Yeah. It just seems like the guy is like, you look at him, he's so slimy, you expect him to betray it. That's where I think the big twists are when he's actually on your side. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't stay on your side long enough to actually make it. I, I would have liked it more if, you know, we had a chance to like see them like change sides and actually have that play out any. And then also that I like that he then becomes the opposition in that both him and Snake are trying to steal the same thing at the same time. Mm -hmm. So you got a bit of that national treasure plot where, you know, we need to steal it to keep him from stealing it. Which, I don't know, I think Snake could, the reason why he wants to steal is because he wants to like, oh, I'm going to steal it first, then sell it, then I'll kill Mars. But I'm like, Snake's usually too expedient for that. So yeah. I think he would just typically just like, he'd shoot Mars and then try to make the sale. And it probably would have been better off for him in the long run. And I'll be honest, a lot of Mars's personality came for me because he looked like Bruce Campbell and I kept getting Bruce Campbell's voice in my head and I wanted that movie. I can kind of see that. And admittedly, we've had Bruce Campbell in a Snake Plissken film before. Also, I'm just finishing up Burn Notice. Oh, uh, okay. Where his character is basically like a good version of this character. Yeah. So it's like I, I have Bruce Campbell very much in my head to this day. Mm -hmm. Bruce Campbell never leaves once he settles in. I even read his entire book. Wonderful book. Oh, I have to. It sounds like Bruce Campbell. His sidekicks are Phobos and Demos, the two giant identical twin black guy bodyguards. Yeah, which I thought was, I, I did think that was kind of a clever as far as a guy named Mars. There's not much to them, but that's a fun gimmick. Yeah. <laughs> And then Snake gets rescued by Captain Ron, Captain Ron Hill, which was also done as a reference. Mm -hmm. I like that beyond the name, they're not like trying to say, this is the real Captain Ron. You know, it's a completely different characterization. Right. It's just a shout out. They built him into an interest. You know, he's like Cabby, you know, from the first movie where he's not a bad guy. He just he's a guy who lives in a bad world and has to live in it. Now, tell me, what did you think when Snake decides, I'm going to kill this guy? I liked it because it's that kind of moment where this guy knows my plan. Mm -hmm. That might be a danger to me. That might prevent me from getting my plan done. I looked at it more like Snake was trying to figure out if he should. Okay. And then, of course, he gets interrupted before he can. But I don't... Snake might have gone through with it. But I think that's kind of what makes Snake the character he is. He might go through with it. He might not. Yeah. I don't know. It just seems like all he really needed was the guy's boat, at least as far as like way the plan went. So he could have just stolen the boat and maybe tied up the guy. So maybe that's what he was going to do. Like he was just going to hold him at knife point rather than kill him off. But it seems, you know, like, oh, this nice old guy who he decides like, oh, I'm going to let him in on my plan so that way I can steal this boat. And he declines and politely declines. And then he, you see Snake with a knife aimed at his back. I like it because it, again, plays on Snake's moral complexity. Mm -hmm. He's not a good guy. No. And there's probably other people like this who he has killed in the past. And that's actually probably what leads to him also being so self-loathing as he always is. Yeah. 
to me, it was just a slight hair, a little bit too much into the bastard category as opposed to the bastard with a heart of gold category. I think if he had picked up the knife and looked at the old guy instead of having the shot of him like coming up behind the old guy with the knife. Yeah. That would have sold him asking the question in his head. Right. You know, stewing it over. And then getting interrupted and then you can decide for yourself whether or not he was going to do it as opposed to having the knife raised up in his hand towards the guy's back. I think that would have made that go down a little bit better for me. And I, I like Captain Ron. Oh, yeah. He could have very easily been a comic relief character, but instead he was that kindly voice of reason. You know, I love that he pays the price. He does get killed by Snake because of this mission. And I like that he's just kind of like, you know, don't worry about it. I got to go out on one last adventure. Yeah. And I like that he was like, didn't really care about the money, but he's like, you know what? If I'm going to go, I'm going to go to Rio. I'm going to have, you know, it's just like he was an old guy who was looking for like one last good time. I actually like the character. I mean, as much as I maybe don't recommend the series, I think he and the female character, I think those are the ones I really enjoyed the most. But we probably should talk about the... Uh... It is time to get down and funky, yes? Yeah. Yeah. Big Red, an Armenian gunrunner who is obsessed with... Saturday Night Fever. Saturday Night Fever. Yeah. I loved that. It's something that I was kind of rolled my eyes at first, and I was like, uh... It's, again, it's a character I could see in an Elmore Leonard novel. Yeah. An Armenian gunrunner who loves disco, because those were the only English movies he grew up I don't know if you've read any of Matt Fraction's Hawkeye series. Not yet. There's... They call them the tracksuit Draculas, which are basically (laughs) all these, like... Vaguely European, not specific any country, but, you know, guys in tracksuits who are all, they just call everyone bro and they just, come on bro. They didn't look like Big Red, but they look a lot like his flunkies. Between that and the accent of Big Red, it just reminded me a lot of that. And I had the exact same thing when I saw Matt Fraction series. I rolled my eyes. It's like, oh, Europeans, we're going to mock them for their accent and maybe not having completely mastered a complete different language. But after a while, it just gets fun. So I can't really fault it too much because I did actually have fun with that part. Having a character have an accent doesn't mean you're automatically mocking the accent, though. Well, it's a little bit. I mean, the way they phrase things, you could tell, like, you're supposed to, like, kind of chuckle. Well, but again, I love that he's just putting, like, spins on disco phrases that just Mm -hmm. a word is off. It's not, like, beating you over the head with it. No, no. Like I said, it could have gone down wrong, but in the end, it won me over for the most part. And the fact that they don't overuse him too much. He's in, like, two of the issues. Yeah, he's introduced, and then I love that you kind of forget about him, and then he suddenly comes back and kills Captain Ron. Right. He's the one who shoots him. I actually like how this book uses cliffhangers. Mm -hmm. I love the bit where near the end where he's struggling with Snake and he accidentally shoots one of his own goons in the head (laughs) and he feels so bad about it. He's like, I'm sorry, I'm not the one who meant to shoot you. (laughs) Yankee pig, grab my hand. Right. (laughs) Oh, poo. Any bad guy who will say something like, oh, poo, I'm fine with that. <laughs> and then I'm trying to remember, oh, that, and then, yeah, the police helicopter lands on him. <laughs> right. My goose is now cooked. Yeah, he's a character I could actually see. I don't know if he would actually show up quite like that if it was in the actual, like, movie, but he would be something very close to that, I think. Mm-hmm. He's, like, 80% there of being a John Carpenter mid-level boss. And we should point out, I, we didn't do it earlier, John Carpenter, Deborah Hill, and Kurt Russell were involved in this it is their plot they did sign off on a lot of the characters they signed off on the script they were involved especially deborah hill especially if you read the back matter she was deeply involved with this i did kind of laugh a little bit when uh, apparently john carpenter just said if the art looks like this i don't care what the stories are like like just kind of reluctant my thoughts a little bit of the series as a whole i still don't agree with you well and i think <laughs> and as i'm talking it over with you i think i'm softening a little bit but i still think overall the story is not its best part i think the first comic did get into the world a little more but i think what i liked about this is it's a different kind of snake plissken story it's not the type of one that we had where he goes to infiltrate a thing fight a bad guy save the president no it's a heist job it is and again it's very elmore lenardian where the plot is almost secondary to here's just a bunch of characters constantly butting against each other well and based upon what little we know of what snake was doing like when we see hershey in la they talk about like there was some sort of job that they had that went bad mm-hmm. and we don't know exactly what happened Happen, but we know just enough. To, it feels like she could have been a part of this story if they had wanted to. She would have fit in this type of story very well. You never know. That might have involved the engineered multivirus. <laughs> 
Possible. Let's get to our next character who I don't remember her name and I don't know how I look at her up, but it's the one who's dressed as Jackie O. I don't think she's ever given a name because I tried to look for that and I didn't notice one. I love how she's just kind of a gag character at first, but then she just keeps sticking around long enough to actually build into a fun character. Yeah. I love that she's not really a good guy or a bad guy. She's just kind of along for the ride and yet she doesn't feel like she's being dragged along like a damsel in distress. Right. She's not really a victim per se, even even though she obviously would not want to be in the situation. And she lives at the end, which is rare for anyone who hangs out with Snake. Uh, yeah, I was surprised <laughs> in the last comic that the one girl didn't die, but she was only in it for a few panels. She wasn't really in the plot. She was just sitting there. Yeah, this one, she gets involved, especially like after Captain Ron died. I was like, oh, she's next. And nope. I love even the bit where it's like, why are you still here? It seems safer with you. <laughs> Which I can kind of see. like, it, it, And then like, I think the helicopter crashes into Big Red and she's like, see? <laughs> yeah, I could see like basically the world is probably such a dangerous place, especially mm-hmm. when you've got armed senior citizens. I could see like her just deciding, you know what? I'm going to stay with the guy who, yeah, he is super dangerous, but at least he seems to be able to take care of himself. And then there's the big Indian collector who wants to buy the car because mm-hmm. he wants to impress girls and Hollywood. And I like that they kind of ended on the tease of those two just hooking up. <laughs> well, and one thing I liked about him was the fact that he was smart enough to realize, like, when Snake delivers a car, and of course, by this point, it's been shot up, it's all yeah. scratched and dinged, and he's like, you're not going to get one dime from me, and Snake just stares him down, and then he just, well, it's not... All that bad. Um, go get my money, please. You know. Yeah. Which, you know. It could have been worse. Could have, yeah, he could have. He was smart enough to realize, like, Snake's not a guy you really want to just go back on a deal with. I kind of like that he's not really a bad guy. He's just a rich idiot. Yeah. And he just is involved with all these really bad guys just to get this one collectible. Mm-hmm. And then I, I just love, though, that it ends her on the line of looking to the guy and going, how rich? Yeah. <laughs> and it's just like, okay, yeah, so they're probably going to hook up. I was fine with that. It was just silly, but it was funny. Oh, yeah. Considering he didn't have a very large part in the story at all, but I liked her like as a character because she never really feels, like you said, like a damsel in distress. Yes, she is technically dragged into this. And yeah, there are a lot of bits where Snake is yelling at her, push the button, remove the lever or something like that. But she's not doing like the Willy and Temple of Doom thing where she's just constantly shrieking at everything. Right. She's dived into the thick of it. Like as tasteless of a psychic as it is, I love the visual of her climbing over the back of the car to pull Captain Ron in. Yeah. Which is the whole Jackie O pulling in the Secret Service agent. <laughs> right. And that was about the same time that they shot the fake JFK in the backseat. The bullet went through the dummy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> which that was the gag I was referring to. That was like, I knew that was going to happen as soon as I saw it and I thought I wasn't going to like it but I actually did kind of like that joke and then I like that she feels like a what if just a normal person was pulled into the situation she's just a normal person who puts on a costume and works on the show floor of a museum you know right she's no one special she doesn't have a big job She's just a person who gets dragged into this and still performs admirably. Mm -hmm. You know, she's completely out of her element and she still tags along and holds her own. And she was the fun surprise of this book. Yeah. If this had gone on, I would like to have seen her maybe stick around for a little bit longer. I have a feeling that you really can't have like a whole lot of supporting characters that will just tag along for very long with Snake. Yeah. But I could see her possibly getting roped into another adventure with him. And I even like the bit of poignance where Captain Ron gets shot, but he doesn't die right away. And they have to go through watching this guy who just went through all this with him. A guy who Snake contemplated killing earlier, dying in front of him. And I actually like that bit where he's like, look, can you do me one last favor? Can you tell me your real name? And I love that Snake leans over, whispers in his ear, and his dying words are, oh, no shit. I like that (laughs) moment, too. There's a lot of little moments I liked, even if I didn't think the overall story. I think the big thing for me is the dialogue was just really what drove me nuts as much as anything, which some of it works, but I think it works better when you... I think if you had cut down the dialogue by, like, half. See, and I agree with you on Snake. Like, I do agree with you on those catchphrases, but there's so few of them, and I love everyone else's dialogue. Yeah, I think some of it, like, you know, Mars calling Snake all these different names like Cobra Francisco or whatever. Yeah, he has a different name for him. I thought that kind of got a little... They didn't overdo it. Well, once you got up to Ass Pole, then that was kind of like, really, that's yeah. the payoff? Like I said, I think I've softened a little bit just discussing it with you, but it's still... I think if you're going to read one of these two books that we've discussed today, I would go with The Adventures more than I would go with this one. See, and I would go with this one more. I think Adventures was fun and had some neat little world-building 
things, but it's also kind of anticlimactic. This feels like a full story. This feels like a full Snake Plissken adventure from beginning to middle and end. If you had maybe a little bit more time to edit this down... I wouldn't cut it down. I think it's incredibly brisk, as it is. Not necessarily, like, lengthwise. Just cut some of the dialogue down, go through, get rid of some of the one-liners... I think that I probably would have liked it a little bit more. It just, for whatever reason, it just... Just didn't click with you? Yeah. I shouldn't say I love it. I really enjoy it. I get it. Let me put it this way. If you prefer Escape from L.A., go with Adventures. If you prefer Escape from New York, go with Chronicles. There you go. Because Chronicles is a more kind of leaner... I I mean, yeah, there's a lot going on, but it's a much more simpler, streamlined story. It's more just a heist about everyone screwing each other over. It's got that kind of meaner edge to it. Mm -hmm. Whereas Adventures is a little more over the top. I mean, granted, this one's over the top too with Disco Inferno, but... yeah. (laughs) It is in a way that you could see in a typical crime film. Right. Well, and like I said, I think Big Red could have been a character in a John Carpenter film. If either of these was going to be a John Carpenter movie, I think this one would. Yeah, I think you're probably right. The other one's a little more uh, Stallone Judge Dredd. The robot kind of reminded me a bit of that, yeah. Which I love Stallone's Judge Dredd, don't get me wrong. Uh, you're... Magnificent movie. Oh, we're not going to get into that now. Any final thoughts on the Snake Plissken adventures of this earlier era? No, I think they fit the films pretty well. And the fact that they're basically fun. And they're two very different things, but they both still fit. The two different films are very different, despite having the same director and same actor. And I think your your comparison was apt. I think that Adventure is a lot more close to L.A. and Chronicles is a lot closer to New York. See, and and we already established you prefer L.A. and I prefer New York. Right. And I think that sticks pretty true here. And at the same time, I don't think either one of them are great films. And I don't think either comics are great comics. I think you can have some fun with either one of them, depending on what you're looking for. But that said, I do think that if you're a fan, one of these is probably going to be worth your time checking out, depending on what you're looking for. You know, the thing is, I kind of disagree with that in that I would say that if you've never seen any of them, if you've never seen either film and you wanted to find out, hey, what is this Snake Plissken all about? I would actually say that Chronicles is one that you could pick up as an introduction to Snake. Yeah. There's no deep continuity ties. It's more just your typical Clint Eastwood gunslinger wanders into a new adventure. And again, if you like Elmore Leonard novels, if you like those crime heist plots that have a bit of a humorous twist to them, I think it's something that you could enjoy and you could go from this to the movies. Mm -hmm. I don't know that that would work as well for Adventures. Adventures is more of a direct tie-in. Yeah. Adventures is trying to fit into the universe. Like I said, I think Kaminsky did a really good job of doing his homework and trying to fit this into that universe. But if you don't know it, you're going to get confused. I mean, you won't get confused because there's not enough there to really confuse you. They don't spend any time to really do anything other than just tell a Snake Plissken story. I appreciate that because that's something rare among tie-ins, where tie-ins are almost always exclusively aimed at people who already know something. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that this is something that you could start here. This could be a jumping on point for new people who have never seen a Snake Plissken movie. Which, considering when this came out, this was like, what, 2003? 2003. Last movie had been out like six, eight years, eight yeah. year, uh, a while, and it wasn't like it was a super well-known success story. Though, again, that's been interesting, discovering how many people our age have deep ties to Escape from L.A. It's surprising. Well, <laughs> for me, it was the fact that that was the one I actually saw first, so that may be part of the reason why I tend to lean towards that one a little bit more. See, I saw it first, too. Yeah. And then and I saw New York after. But then again, I also then saw Assault on Precinct 13. And like that deeply affected me. And I think that's why I like New York because it leans more Assault on Precinct. That makes sense. I can see like they were probably trying to keep in mind that there could be an audience. You know, I imagine that this probably had not played a whole lot on television after the initial run on HBO. And if you hadn't seen it in the theater or on television after it initially went to video. And so I could see that they were trying to build up a potential audience for people who maybe have heard of Snake Plissken, but not necessarily knew who he was. And especially since, like you said, at that time, Carpenter Hill and Russell were trying to do future... um, They were trying to do a whole multimedia franchise. Right. So I think that makes sense that they would try to like maybe just consider this not necessarily a new continuity or anything, but just a fresh start. Jumping on point. Yeah. For new people. And they were probably hoping that the game would probably be coming out about the same time that, or at least shortly thereafter and that they could tie the comic into it more into that as well. Mm -hmm. And 
I bet you there was a lot of plans that just unfortunately we'll never be privy to. I would love to have sat in on some of those meetings. Yeah, just to hear them stew around story concepts and stuff. Mm -hmm. It is kind of sad that supposedly, just based on our own guesses, the first one fell victim to Marvel finally burying Malibu. This one fell victim to, within the year later, cross-gen shuttered its doors. Mm -hmm. The main reasons why neither one went on were probably beyond how well they sold their readership. Not to say that they were probably best-selling books. I doubt that they were, but they were already kind of doomed from the beginning. Yeah, I suspect that the video game was kind of the same thing. I have a feeling that somebody ran out of money because that's typically why these... You don't have a game that well polished looking unless you just run out of money. Oh, oh, that's right. I just suddenly remembered I had looked it up when we were doing our Escape from L.A. episode. Part of what probably happened with the video game was Namco around 2003, 2004 merged with Bandai. That could have probably upset whatever was going on. Because I remember seeing the, didn't have the Namco Bankai logo when they showed the YouTube. Yeah, that stuff was shown in, I want to say 2003. Mm. Maybe beginning of 2004. The merger was finalized in 2005, and it had been going on the year before. But it was being developed between 2003 and 2005, as according to Ain't It Cool. And so it probably was around that time that video was made. Yeah, I'm just, I'm looking at issue three here, because I think that was when they announced it. Yeah. They just announced in three that Namco had just secured the rights. Mm. So it probably would have taken them time to develop the game. Yeah. And there's no copyright page on this book, so I can't see exactly when the issue came out. And I think four came out in February of 2004. So this probably would have been January. Yeah. Or possibly December or something close to that. So it was probably late 2004 that that happened. And again, the merger was announced. They were beginning in May of 2005. So what it looks like is that the game was sidelined because of the merger with Bandai. Again, through no fault of the game. Right. And that happens way more often than you'd think. A new company either buys out or the people who are publishing it or have the rights to it decide that they want to go in a different direction. And so all the development worked, even though people have been working on it for maybe months and maybe only need like a few more months to finish it. And they just don't have the time or the money to do it. So it gets dropped. And unfortunately, some of these really interesting projects that you hear about later on just never get finished, which is a shame. And then I would like to know what happened with the anime. I'm not going to dig into production IG again, but I'm just wondering if it was just like this whole thing of it's not so much that they did the wrong thing, but they did it at the wrong time. Because it seems like every avenue, let's start the video game right before the company merges with another one. Let's start the comic right before the company folds. Yeah, it could have just been like at that point, they just decided, you know what, you know, nothing we've done has really worked out the way we wanted it to. And they may have just decided to move on and do their own thing. And then I want to say Deborah Hill passed away in 2005. I think that sounds right. Because it was during the production of the Fog remake, because that was the last thing that her and John, she passed away in 2005. And John, I love John, but he's not much of a go-getter. That's why a lot of his success has always kind of depend on who he's partnered with as a producer. I can see that being why things stopped moving forward after that. I mean, I know a lot of the recent push, like the recent comics are because Sandy King, his wife and production partner, she's been doing a big push to try to get stuff out there. I would like to see more from Snake. There's a, obviously yeah. a whole another comic series we haven't quite touched yet. And I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. We're planning on doing at least some of that some point in the future. But we have something else coming up next, don't we? Yes. That's called a segue, folks. It involves evil. Evil in its most pure form. Donald Trump? <laughs> it's huge. <laughs> God. Uh. You brought that on yourself. I am going to build a wall around Michael Myers. It's going to be huge. Uh, he's going to pay for it himself. I'll make him pay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm currently editing Halloween 6, the one he passed away on. So <laughs> oh. Yeah, no, so we're going to be getting into Halloween comics, which there's quite a good handful of them. So it's definitely going to be more than one episode. Yeah. 
God help us all. I'm surprised that there currently aren't Halloween comics, given how many John Carpenter properties there are. I'm a little bit more nervous about this one. I think horror works best when you minimize your exposure to the audience. And unfortunately, there's a whole lot of Halloween movies and there's a whole lot of Halloween comics. It might be another thing from another world experience. Oh, it's the thing on a boat. It's the thing in the jungle. It's, you know. It's the shape on a plane. It's the shape on a train. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) I'm a little concerned as to how much you can really do with a character like Michael Myers. I'm still curious to find out, so... And from having just poked at them, I've already seen plenty of copious gore and nudity that we're in store for. Oh, well, we got that going for us, so... Boobs! Boobs make everything better. And I just said that on something that will be forever immortalized in podcast... I can edit it if you want me to. (laughs) No, you're good. Now I'm just imagining. Have you ever heard that tubular boobular song that they did on Mystery Science Theater? Yes. Imagine a terrified Donald Pleasance screaming out that song. Oh, God. <laughs> it's still the movie of the breasticle chesticle. <laughs> Evil. Uh, and then you get Malcolm McDowell to join in. Oh, Malcolm. Yeah. So I think that brings us to a close on the uh, adventures and chronicles of Snake Plissken, for the moment at least. Thank you for joining me again, JD. Oh, thank you, Noel. And discussing this with you has been a real trip. Uh, asshole. It is too funky town, no? <laughs> <laughs> Masters of Carpentry can be found at mastersofcarpentry.blogspot.com and is in no way affiliated with John Carpenter or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. Our theme music is Black Rainbow by Jack Locke. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J A K L O C K E.com. Oh, you know what? Hmm. It'd help if I'd actually open the comics. Yeah. You don't remember what happens panel by panel? I don't. <laughs> I don't remember all the weirdly random human sound effects from that first one. <laughs> Sorry, we keep bringing it back to Transformers for some reason. Uh, yeah, there's a reason for that. Yeah, at least none of these are written by Simon Furman. I want John Carpenter to come back and direct Transformers 5 or 6 or whatever they're on now. Just have him team up with Simon Furman and do a Death's Head movie. <laughs> there you go. And admittedly, I don't like arguing with my friends yeah. anyways, even though... JD, you suck. Oh, well, <laughs> you're probably right. I'm sure you do it gently, though. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway. I can't wait for Chicago. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can argue how good it is it as an adaptation of the book, but as just a movie on its own, it is a spectacular fable for our times. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I respect your opinion, and you're my friend, so I will I will leave it there. <laughs> and you think I'm probably just amping this up as a joke. I'm not. Oh, I, I believe you. I know. I know you Sincerity, you're... yes. I believe you, my friend. I just can't go there. Rob Schneider is exactly what that movie needed. Now, if you said Demolition Man, I would be in total agreement. Oh, I love Demolition Man, too. I think the two of them are just two peas in a pod. Uh, I don't know about that. Maybe two nuts in a scrotum. I don't want one or the other. Oh, uh... <laughs> No.